Hello everyone, how are you? I'm Ari Thiriger and today for our first video of October I'm going to talk about the Pact with the Devil, which is a recurrent theme in medieval and modern European witch hunts and witch trials. And the idea that witches would do an alliance with the devil, binding themselves to him in order to obtain supernatural powers. The idea of the pact became the very thing with which witches were confronted in trials and be condemned. A direct and willing contact with the devil and making the pact was the proof the church needed to execute people accused of heresy, apostasy and blasphemy. The idea of the pact with the devil is one of the most important elements in the study of witch hunts, so we may understand the religious mentality of these periods, especially in relation to the religious clashes between Catholicism and Protestantism, as well as the surviving folklore and traditional folk magic among the people, the common folk, especially of rural areas, and their long-lasting traditions of an agricultural character. Even though the idea of the pact with the devil has much fantasy about it, concocted by the church itself, there's some truth to it concerning the relationships people would build and maintain with supernatural entities in order to create an ongoing symbiotic spiritual relationship with the objective to bring forth beneficial aspects to the community people lived in. So the supposed pact witches would do with the devil, indeed it has certain elements of truth which report back to an animistic mentality and the need to create a relationship with a spiritual entity or several spiritual entities. And from this ongoing relationship, a certain degree of power is given to the person by the spirits to apply that power for the benefit of the community of the living. So in this, we also find parallels with shamanism. But I'm, go I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's get right to it, shall we, my dear friends? Please. One of the most recurrent elements in witch trials and one of the components that helped to build the stereotype of the medieval witch was precisely the idea that witches made a pact with the devil. And from such an alliance, they would uh, gain supernatural powers and abilities. The pact with the devil and the very figure of the devil was of little importance when dealing with witchcraft and common sorcery in the early centuries of Christianity, practically for a thousand years, give or take, until the figure of the devil became the personification of the Antichrist and a religious tool with which the church would work with to force the existence of evil and or the existence of people working against the church in order to secure the church's power by sil silencing people for their supposed acts against God and humanity. Witchcraft was nothing more than the survival of traditional folk magic and belief systems prior to Christianity, so the lingering paganisms did not permit a full consolidation of the new religious power. So the idea of the pact with the devil was instrumental in reconstructing the figure of the witch and the idea of witchcraft as heresy and transforming its practitioners into dangerous heretics that not only had renounced Christ in order to serve their master, the devil, but through magical means were also fighting against the church itself. The idea of the pact with the devil was fundamental to awaken or let's say reawaken the old fears of witches and people who dealt with magic, augmenting that fear within society to better expel the remnants of pagan rituals, beliefs and celebrations. So, first we must look into an important type of philosophy and worldview that greatly shaped the idea of magic and sorcery, and that is the Aristotelian worldview, of course, inspired by the work of Aristotle. Although, um, it must be pointed out that indeed very little knowledge concerning Aristotle, Aristotle um, lingered on in the ecclesiastical centers of Western Europe in the late Middle Ages, so much of what was known of his works by that time were mainly documents by later authors, so obviously many things had already been altered to fit into the particular religious worldviews of the time that indeed may have had nothing to do with the original Aristotelian teachings. But uh, I, I'm not going to focus too much on that. 
Suffice it to say that the Aristotelian worldview of the medieval ecclesiastical centers of Western Europe constructed a definite understanding of magic and all forms of sorcery, and that was that all forms of sorcery and magic lay under the control of the devil, and therefore he governed over all sorts of magic and sorcery. So basically the belief in magic and sorcery changed. So anything of a magical nature or character was the work of the devil or derived from him. This religious view changed everything, because until then there was still the belief that beneficial magic existed, or, or in other words, uh, white magic. So believing that all magic was of the devil, then there was no such thing as beneficial or white magic. So anyone, absolutely anyone, who practiced magic or of any kind, was therefore dealing with the devil. So this was the key argument to end all sorts of traditional folk magic and beliefs, as well as uh, lingering pagan mentalities. Anyone doing anything that resembles a work of magic or sorcery was working against the church, had renounced Christ and therefore was an enemy of the human race. So because it was already previously believed that the devil was a trickster and everything the devil did wasn't without wanting something in return, if magic was the province of the devil, as, as it was now understood, then all those practicing magic were receiving it from the devil, therefore they had to give to him something in return. And here is the basis for the pact with the devil. The belief that practitioners of magic had to first give something to the devil, in return for the ability to do magic and have supernatural powers and abilities. Some recompense and reverence had to be provided. As such, this was heresy and apostasy. The very act of doing magic was already understood as a denial in the existence of God or renouncing God as the supreme ruler of the universe, an abandonment of the true faith and a direct attack against humanity and all that is governed and protected by God, since the practitioner of magic and or sorcery was now believed to be instead presenting reverence to the devil, the great enemy of all life within the late medieval Christian religious beliefs. So now this is when we jump into the nature of the pact and the very idea of creating a relationship with an entity in order to receive power. During the Middle Ages and throughout the modern period, an important component in the study of magic was the knowledge of demons, a study that came to be known as demonology. So, it became common knowledge that Lucifer had an extensive group of fallen angels, a variety of demons who spread his power and had great influence upon humans, upon humanity. Two of the most common, let's say, categories of demons were the so-called incubus and succubus a male and female demons, respectively, who had sexual intercourse with their victims through dreams, and therefore inflicted illness and could even cause death, but also gave supernatural powers to their victims, or even cause illusions and dreams of a particular nature that usually became associated as signs of being a witch, and through these dreams having deal dealings with other witches and the devil. And here lies the basis of the pact with the devil, which is having sexual intercourse with the devil or his servants in order to obtain magical power. And indeed, there's some truth to this in relation to shamanism and animistic worldviews that still lingered on in Western Europe, Europe, <laughs> uh, body spirit. Uh, I have already explored uh, this very subject on the video concerning sexuality and gender identity in shamanism and the case of spirit spouses. On that video I have mentioned as well, quite briefly, the case of incubus and succubus, a male and female spirits having sexual intercourse with human beings and uh, becoming the sort of lovers of their human victims, of the opposite sex. This conception was introduced in the Middle Ages as a form of um, Christian religious explanation for the spiritual entities of the pagans with whom people, the pagans, had a more intimate relationship with. And this idea of female demons having sexual intercourse with male humans and male demons with female humans was greatly developed after colonialism, actually, and uh, introduced into a variety of societies and cultures 
especially in African cultures, because it's, it's actually in, in African cultures that we find more evidences for spirit spouses, mostly spirit husbands. But overall, it's, it's important to remember that uh, what, what I've said on the previous video concerning the similarities between witchcraft and shamanism, uh, one of which is precisely obtaining power, magic or magical power, and both in traditional witchcraft and in most shamanic cultures, the human person obtains power through an ongoing relationship with a spirit or several spiritual entities, which are often known as tutelary spirits and or familiar spirits. The acquisition of power both in traditional witchcraft and shamanism is often by the creation of a spiritual relationship and, and the means vary quite a lot, of course, could be sexual intercourse, could be possession of spirit or being possessed by a spirit, could be binding or attachment, can also be through an ongoing pragmatic behavior towards the spiritual in order to create a symbiotic relationship etc. The point here is working to build and maintain a relationship with spiritual entities from which the human person receives power in order to apply that power within the community, or even on a, an individual level, of course, and usually for the benefit of the human person or persons who receive beneficial things through the involvement of the witch or the shaman with the familiar and tutelary spiritual entities. So, we return to the idea of the incubus and succubus. But, but let, let us not dwell too much on such conceptions, because I, I'm, I'm only trying to briefly make the connection here for the sake of the understanding of the pact with the devil and the elements of truth in it from the, the pagan perspective of the past. Even though incubus and succubus were understood as demonic entities in Christian literature, that doesn't mean they are evil in nature or understood to be evil in nature, not among every Christian religious manifestation anyway. In fact, Roman Catholicism sees incubus and succubus as being of the same spiritual substance as angels are. But the only difference is that they have fallen into the pleasures of the flesh. And as such, such entities have sexual intercourse with humans. The point here is that the incubus and succubus, incubi, Sukubi, desire only to express their appetite for sexual release and generally there is no attempt or indeed the primary objective isn't to harm anyone. It's just for sexual release. And this is pretty interesting because it, it follows the same line of thought of the animal hybrids and uh, mythical creatures of folklore and of pre-Christian pagan mentality. And the incubi and sukubi are purely spirits none other than the fauns, sylvan, elves, trolls, goblins, and satyrs, and such other creatures of pagan belief. And by the conception of the incubi and succubi, there is actually a reconnection and a new link between the old and the new religious, manif religious manifestations, mainly between what was understood to be pagan and with Catholicism. All these spirits uh, that had intimate relationships with human beings report back to shamanic beliefs, and uh, precisely the shaman having a more intimate relationship with the spirits. Now, this relationship was later on understood as to be a, a marriage of sorts between the shaman and the spirits in question, but understood like this by Western society and an idea greatly fomented during colonialism and post-colonialism. And as such, the male shaman needed a female spirit, and the female shaman needed a male spirit, which isn't, in fact, an original animistic belief. As the attribution of gender, a, du a dual or dualistic gender identity and sexual intercourse between opposite sexes are exp expressions of Abrahamic belief systems. Because in terms of animism, and therefore shamanism, helping spirits or familiar spirits with a close relationship with the shaman and or the traditional witch enter in the category of tutelary spirits. And such tutelary spirits can take a variety of forms and can shapeshift and don't have to necessarily have a specific gender attributed to them. So the point here is that indeed in traditional witchcraft, traditional witchcraft, the acquisition of power was indeed through an ongoing intimate relationship with spirits, the very spirits that became known later on as the familiar spirits. And this very animistic understanding of traditional folk beliefs that still lingered on in Western Europe by the late Middle Ages 
was twisted into sexual intercourse with the devil or his demons in order to obtain magical power from them. This was the very bargain understood by the church, the very reward the devil gained for lending his power over magic to those who sexually submitted themselves to him. But it doesn't end here. We jump now into necromancy. Necromancy was actually a form of magic that became highly popular during the late Middle Ages, around the 13th century, all over Europe. Necromancy originally had obviously other connotations and was mainly the, the, the conjuring or summoning, summoning of the spirits of the dead or the ancestors for prophetic purposes, right? But with the increasing study of demonology and the nature of demons, Necromancy gained a whole other aspect, and, main, and, and many were those, even within ecclesiastical centers, that began to conjure demons in an attempt to gain hidden knowledge and to perform acts of magic. Various grimoires began to be created, um, describing the rituals necessary to conjure and control demons. One of the most famous of these books, of these grimoires, is, of course, Goetia also known as Clavicula Solomonis, or the Key of Solomon, with its 72 fallen angels, which King Solomon captured and locked them all safely away in a container that was fastened with a magical seal. Alas, the container was found and the demons accidentally released. The impor important thing to take into consideration here is that the, this grimoire explains how the necromancer might conjure and command these demons and make them do the, the bidding of the conjurer. This is the very grimoire that greatly influenced um, Icelandic magic saves I've spoken before, by, by the way, on, on, the, um, on the video uh, where I explore both the influences and the origins of the Icelandic magic saves, precisely. Now, this became a problem, of course. Necromancy came to reinforce the beliefs of theologians that all acts of magic were performed with the aid of demons and through a relationship with the devil and or his demons. Therefore, it is heresy. So, once again, any kind of magic was understood to be a direct work of the devil or working with the devil. And the popularity of necromancy only came to reinforce that. Mind you that, obviously, uh, there are great uh, theoretical and practical differences between the necromancer and the traditional witch, one of which is precisely whilst the necromancer conjures demons in order to command them to perform acts of magic, the traditional witch, on the other hand, built and maintained an ongoing familiar and even intimate relationship with spirits in order to receive power from them as a gift obtained by the symbiotic animistic relationship. However, this mattered little to the church. In fact, the church did make differences between necromancy and witchcraft, but on a more derogatory level. Necromancy was popular among the royalty, nobility, even within scholastic ecclesiastical centers. So necromancy was understood to be more prestigious, more sophisticated, whilst the common witch was considered less clever and merely a servant of the devil, doing his bidding. So under the control of demons, unlike the necromancer, who was much clever for controlling the demons. So these distinctions were important to the church. Most necromancers were not condemned because they could control demons, uh, and also, of course, due to the fact that necromancy was at the very midst of the religious and political powers of the accusers. However, necromancy came to reinforce that all magic was indeed performed through the aid of demons. So it was the witches that were accused because they did not control demons per se, but were controlled instead by the demons and by the devil. So you, you see the extent of the twisted religious mechanisms over the original animistic relationships traditional witches had with spiritual entities. So this is the very basis of the pact with the devil. How the church saw it, which became the irrefutable proof of the witch's guilt. Magic within royalty and nobility and the church lingered on because it was created a more distinctive and sophisticated neoplatonic vision of it, turning the magic arts into the realm of science, to turn it away from the implications of demonic pacts. As such, witchcraft began to be seen as just 
common peasant superstition completely irrational. You see, anything deemed to be ir irrational as in opposition to the magic performed by the elite was automatically placed in the realms of superstition, the supernatural, in opposition to the scientific, in a derogatory sense, uh, and under a demonic pact. In, in other words, the patriarchal system repressing the traditional folk beliefs conducted by women in their great majority, but also by the people in general outside the elite sphere. So, after what has been said, we understand the impact of the belief in a pact with the devil from the part of witches. The idea of the pact appears in several witch trials, especially during the time period of the religious wars of Catholicism versus Protestantism. The Reformation came to reinforce even further the view that witches made pacts with the devil and worshipped him as a false idol. Luther believed witches were not as common in his day uh, as, as in his childhood precisely because his own religious reformations and the revealed gospel forced the devil into retreat, so he believed his own religious beliefs and attitudes were quite solid and a just war on heresy. But he still believed that witches existed and made alliances with the devil, so the fight went on, particularly against Catholics, who, after all, practiced necromancy, no matter how much they tried to convert it, it into a scientific and sophisticated matter. As I said on other videos, the great witch trials and executions are precisely between the years of 1580 and 1640. That's when 80% of the victims accused of witchcraft have been executed, which is no ordinary period. It is precisely the period of religious wars. The Reformation splits in half Western Christianity, and there's a stronger belief that the devil is putting out all his efforts to destroy Christianity. So the old medieval fear on witches and the belief in the devil and the pact with the devil is augmented during this period. So the belief that witches practiced a religion controlled by the devil, in which the devil gave them supernatural powers and abilities, became the center of the religious wars. And therefore the prosecutions, trials and executions of witches was also magnified. The period of religious wars led to religious zealots, fighting to remove all evil from the, the human society, to prepare the world for the second coming of Christ. And, and, and at this point, it was no longer the condemnation and execution of traditional witches, but anyone who, who was accused of practicing magic, especially Catholics, which had been quite benevolent <laughs> at the beginning and uh, not only allowed certain pagan celebrations to continue, but also practiced forms of magic and sorcery especially the case of necromancy within royalty and the church itself. Protestants th uh, thought Catholics had been too benevolent, which was why the devil and his servants still existed and were on the loose upon the world. And of course, in the rural areas, uh, even though people had been Christianized long before, certain aspects of traditional folk magic and beliefs lingered on, obviously, which is perfectly normal and understandable, since witchcraft is the very ability to adapt and survive the changes of society by adopting and incorporating different religious systems of belief and practical behaviors, enriching and expanding traditional folk magic. But Protestantism was having nothing of the sort, and all traces of what was understood to be the religion of the devil had to be wiped out. And the pact with the devil was the key element to rightly condemn someone as being in league with the devil and practicing a religion controlled by the devil. Therefore, heresy, apostasy and a crime against humanity, in the church's view, of course. There was no pact with the de devil, obviously, never was. But there was some truth behind this idea, which was the lingering pragmatic behavior of folk traditions towards familiar spirits, the ongoing relationship with the invisible and visible populations of the world, animals, plants, uh, spirits of the place, deities, elements, ancestors, and so on and so forth. The animistic worldview and the belief that the world is populated with persons, most of which are not human persons, but are spiritual entities nonetheless, from whom beneficial aspects of life can be created through the symbiotic relationship that human, the human persons build and maintain with these spiritual entities of the world through reasoning and bargaining to avoid catastrophe, harm, 
damage, illness, and even death among the human community. So the idea of the familiar spirit was also twisted. And it became the, a case of witches having pet demons that they named and cared for and nurtured. A, a belief that became quite popular in the 14th century, actually, particularly in England and Germany. But this belief testifies to the origins of traditional folk beliefs in pagan nature, spirits, fairies, elves, hobgoblins, all sorts of spiritual entities inhabiting both in the natural world and within the domestic environment of the human populations. Usually spirits with some degree of power that could uh, bring both beneficial and, of course, harmful things to the human populations and the world itself according to the relationships that were built for instance, as an example, the spirit of the hearth could bring beneficial things if the ongoing relationship with the spirit was beneficial and to the spirit regular offerings were given and the sort of practical behavior that demonstrates respect but also acknowledging the existence of the spirit and welcoming it. If the relationship was inexistent and the spirit neglected, this could cause the hearth spirit to be angry and cause harm, damage, even illness, usually because many domestic spirits are understood as ancestral entities, so they require a certain degree of comfort and acknowledgement within the familiar space. The same thing with spirits of the natural world, like elves, with which, through a relationship of respect, many beneficial things can sprout from such a relationship, such as helping in the fertility of the soils and the growth of food. So, all these spiritual entities of an animistic worldview that still lingered on in the collective mentality of rural populations far into the Middle Ages were eventually turned to demons. And indeed, the very real relationships with such entities became the very basis of the pact with the devil. The idea of the pact was inherent in the witches' dealings with their familiar spirits and, and, and they were therefore accused of having nurtured such demons, even breastfeeding them and a whole set of attitudes towards such demons in return for magical power and assistance. When in truth, it has its origins in the ongoing relationships with spirit entities, both visible and invisible, and even the simple fact of having actual pets, animal companions, and taking care and nurturing animals. Which is why one of the most usual forms of the witch's familiars is usually the demon that takes the form of a cat. The association between demons and animals is quite the old one, of course, and for a, a very long time it was believed that both demons and witches and sorcerers would and could transform themselves at, at will into shapes of animals. But this took all other proportions by the end of the Middle Ages, especially during the 14th century, and, of course, far worse between the 16th and the 17th centuries with the religious wars and Europe torn in half since the Reformation. Well, the pact with the devil is an important theme uh, when studying witchcraft, especially to understand the religious Christian mentality of the late Middle Ages and the modern period, throughout the modern period, which has forever changed the perception and belief in witches and witchcraft. The pact with the devil is important to understand these changes in beliefs and to understand the witch hun hun hunts <laughs> sorry, um, and the, the trials themselves. But it is also important, of course, to perceive the pagan animistic mentality behind it all and the traditional folk beliefs and magic that still lingered on until the madness of Christianity went to extremes and not only innocent humans and animals have perished, but there was an abrupt and very destructive break of the relationship humanity had with the natural world and its inhabitants, whose effects not only have greatly changed our respect towards life and all the natural world, but by neglecting and disrespecting life, we have caused irreversible damage to the very world we live in. Interesting, the amount of damage, indeed, on a global scale, religions can provoke, and frightening how the belief in an invisible tyrannical patriarchal deity has ruined the lives of hundreds of thousands of generations and it tore asunder the very foundations of the earth. Alright my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed today's video and may it be useful somehow and hopefully an eye-opener in certain aspects. 
Thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. And as always, thanks for today. Thank you for today. Goodbye.